very warm welcome to the second in our Sustainable Development Lecture Series this term, focusing on the Sustainable Development Goals. And this is a particularly important lecture coming really early in the series, which addresses that key cross-cutting principle that sits there behind and through the SDGs around development for everybody, around leaving no one behind, around inclusive development. And I think there's no team better to talk about this than um, members of our own participation, inclusion and social change team here at IBS, Danny Burns and Joe Howard, who together with partners, as they'll, they'll explain, have been leading a really important set of projects which both lay behind the inclusion of that leave no one behind element in the SDG agenda when it was formed in 2015 and since has been working hard to think what it really means to leave no one behind as the SDGs get implemented. So um, I'll hand over to them in a minute just to um, say a welcome also to our online audience and to encourage anybody who wants to, to, to tweet, use social media, there's the hashtag there of Sussex Dev. Um, and this is also being streamed online to the IBS Facebook page and it will be available to watch afterwards on the IBS website. So if you have colleagues or friends who aren't able to be here or who couldn't fit into our pack room, then please encourage them to watch. So thanks very much indeed and now over to Joe and Danny. Thank you, Melissa. Um, it's great to see so many of you here, and um, I think what's obvious is that SDGs provoke a response. People come because the SDGs are a mantra because countries across the world are starting to think about them or what to do about them. And for, be for better or worse, they're there, and we have to interact with them, and we have to think about how to make them, them work for us and for the people that we want to work with. Um, what we want to do is focus on, as Moses said, the leave no one behind piece of that um, jigsaw. And just to reflect for a moment what that means. The, the MDGs essentially focus on what I would say would be that swathe of the population that was above in their living standards and their life experiences the most poor and the most marginalised. Some people talk about no hanging fruit. You know, it, it achieved results because it wasn't getting to the most marginalized in most cases. And the shift with the SDGs is that now the focus is on getting to the most marginalized. So what does that actually mean? Well, we want to take you back to the start of our work in, in this area, to an initiative um, which came well before the creation of the SDGs, where we, we and others convened a network of participatory uh, research organizations <coughs> who worked with the poorest and most marginalized to try to bring their voices into the SDG process. And we worked with, um, as you can see, a whole variety of organizations from grassroots groups to NGOs and others um, to build a participatory evidence base to inform the creation of the SDGs um, itself. That the selection of those groups through an international call was very strongly dependent on our definition of participation. We don't claim any rights to, to the definition of participation, but this was our, our definition. And the first part is that people on the ground, the people we're concerned with, the most marginalized, are able to frame their own questions in a way that they feel is important. The second is that they do the analysis and they generate the action out of the analysis, so that it becomes important to them, it's their action for them. And from our perspective, and from the perspective of the partners in this network, the critical thing that this was not just like drop in, drop out sort of research, it was long term research, which was not extractive. And the fundamental principle underpinning all of this is that we're talking about participation, not consultation. <coughs> And most of the people that we engaged with in the early days of this process talked about themselves doing participation, but actually they were doing consultation. And the whole global apparatus was set up for consultation. So all of these groups engaged in multiple different processes. Narrative analysis, where they collected literally hundreds of stories, and those stories were analyzed by them, and then the messages were fed into the process. 
different forms of action research. And we can talk more about some of these methods either here or in a later uh, uh, context. But forms of action research which involve people collecting evidence, um, analyzing that evidence, taking action, looking at what the impact of that action might be. Things like the reality check approach, where policymakers and others go to live with people that are experiencing marginalization and extreme poverty and learn from that process. Um, we introduced a new um, approach, which was a form of deliberative research, where um, people got together in four different countries, uh, very different types of people, juxtaposed together. So um, people, for example, who were Dalits in India, mixed in with uh, transsexuals, mixed in with disabled people, mixed in with a whole variety of different people who had different experiences of marginalization, to come together and take the, um, the sort of the early thinking from the high level panel in the SDGs and say, okay, well, this is what you're thinking, but what are we thinking? And they then played that thinking back into the high level panel. So we had a lot of engagement. Um, with the, uh, probably five key members within the high-level panel. Some generic engagement, but some very specific engagement. And we also created, I mean they created, a wide variety of different types of participatory videos and digital stories. Now the critical thing about this evidence is it explains how and why things happen, and it con conveys their meaning, which is derived from their experience. That's very different to a lot of the data that these high-level panel members were getting and a lot of the people that are starting to program within the SDGs. So I'm just going to show you a quick video, um, which is one of these, uh, to give you an idea of some of the sorts of products they produce. What can you do to help 
this boy? What service can you provide for these children? So, in one three minute video, you can see the complexity of this child's life. And it's not, there's nothing statistical that tells you about um, how many times you've gone to the health clinic or, you know, how many people in the community have got HIV. It tells about a specific person that has to be reached if we're serious about leaving no one behind. And the complexities of all of the interlo interlocking problems that this child has. And that's the sort of evidence we need if we're going to make this leave no one behind a reality. <coughs> when we did this research, when the communities did this research, they came out with two clear messages. <coughs> the first one was that within the SDG process, we were constantly being asked, tell us what the priorities are. Tell us what the priorities are. Tell us what the priorities are. What do people want? Do they want health or education? Do they want employment or whatever? And we just looked at them after engaging with the research and said, they don't want to tell you their priorities. All of these things are important to them. What they're telling us is that how you do development is more important than what development you do. Now, that message is still absolutely critical to the SDGs and to leave no one behind. And the second thing reflects back to that video which is that people in the, who are, if you like, the SDG target group, as opposed to the MDG target group, they have much more complex lives, much more intersecting lives, where you, you make a change in one thing, but if you don't make a change in another three, four, or five, or six, nothing is going to happen. And there are millions of examples of that. You know, massive education program for young women and girls. <coughs> We're all going to end up married at 14, so are not going to benefit from their education, and so on and so forth. Unless we understand all of these things together, it's impossible actually to achieve anything. So we've been using a theory of action which is adapted from some work that I did with a colleague, Stuart, which you can look at in more detail in this book if you need to. Um, but essentially it says, in order to be able to do these sorts of complex pieces of work with these sorts of people, you need to build these three things into every single program that you develop. You need to build a strong strand of participatory engagement. You need to build in learning as you go and learning from the people that are engaged and through and between them and into policy spaces. And you need to be able to intentionally network that learning out so that people understand what's happening. It's only when you can do that that you get the right action that people actually need, the right interventions. And it's only when you get the right interventions that you get ownership of those interventions. And that's ownership from the ground and it's ownership from the top. And once you get ownership, then you can then you can scale and then you can get sustainability. But if you try to scale and sustainability without those things, when you're dealing with these sorts of complex problems, you'll never achieve it. So I just want to end my bit and then hand over to Joe in a minute. I want to end my bit around this issue of evidence. Because in order to do this, evidence is really important. And that's why we as researchers are engaged in this space. We've introduced something to the SDG space called the data revolution. But that basically, for the most part, means collecting uh, national high-level statistical data which is disaggregated by disability, by gender, and various other sorts of things. It doesn't tell you the sorts of things that I've just been talking about. And there are far more sophisticated ways of doing this. So I'm just going to tell you one quick story, which is a piece of work that I'm doing now with colleagues, Pauline Aristohoff here and others, um, and Praxis, who are one of the original participate partners on slavery and bonded labor. And I'm just going to take a little fragment out of that. Um, we've been working with bonded laborers, and this piece, this particular piece, is with young women working in the cotton mills in Tamil Nadu. Now these are mostly illiterate women between around 14 and 23. By the time they get to 23, most of them are finished. And I mean that quite literally. That they are so ill from the cotton dust and the conditions in the mills that they, they have to stop working and then their, their daughters go into the mills to replace them. Um, so we've been working with 
NGOs locally um, to generate research and evidence with them, by them. So they've started out by collecting two to, two to three hundred life story narratives. And then we brought them together into these large workshops where they work in pairs with a literate person and a non-literate person to look at what the system dynamics are that they can draw from the stories to understand what's causing what within their life stories. And then as you can see on the big map, they take from those 300 stories and they place them onto a large uh, depiction which allows us to see the bigger level system dynamics that come from all of the stories. Right? Now remember, this is the slaves and the bonded laborers that are doing this. It's, it's not us that's doing the analysis, it's them doing the analysis, and that's what's so pretty. Right? And I'm just going to just show you one thing. So what happened after that is that then they set up action research groups. So from the map, they know what they need to focus on. And one of the critical things that they were looking at was uh, high interest loans from money lenders and how that spirals their situation downwards. One of the action research groups decided at a local level, after having done that macro analysis, that it wanted to look at the village level of expenditure across all the households. So it, um, it, as a group, said, we're going to talk to every household and see what you spend your money on. They'd never done that before. They didn't have a clue. I mean, every household roughly knows what they spend money on, but they've never had it done. So they did it for a whole village. And this is what they came out with. And look to the right-hand column. Food, 21, 22%. Daily expenses for children, 5.73%. Emergency expenses, 6%. Now we we'll get to some of the interesting things. Family functions, gifts to neighbours and friends, nearly 10% of their money. Right? Village festivals, 8.2%. Crisis medical expenses, 10%. Alcohol, 8%. Education, that's positive, 5.6%. And repaying loans, previous loans to the money lender, 24%. Yeah. Now, here you're talking about a village that um, almost all the men have stopped working <coughs> because they're drinking. So the only woman is the woman, the only wage earner is the woman who is earning less than two dollars a day. So when people talk about you know poverty levels of income, one dollar a day, two dollars a day, you're talking about two dollars a day, but actually only 25% of that is going on to daily living. Yeah. So you're talking about people affected who are doing 50 cents a day. So they decided they're going to do something about it. They came together as an action research group and said, we can't afford this anymore, so we're not going to give each other gifts anymore. And they said, um, we're going to go down to the temple and renegotiate how much we give. And they got the elders and others in the community together, and they walked down to the temple, and they sat down and they negotiated, and they negotiated 25% of the amount that they've been paying for the last decades. Right? And then they went and said, we're going to do something about this alcoholism. So they went and they shut down the liquor stores as a group. Right? And then they got together with some of the key people in the villages, and they said, right, we're not having money lenders in our village anymore. And they got the powerful people in the village to keep, to keep the predatory money, money lenders out of the village. These people then told their story to the other eight action research groups, and they all went and did exactly the same thing with the same results. And now we're looking at how that can scale into 240 villages that the local NGOs are working with. So what I'm saying to you is that if you start from the bottom up, working with the very poorest who do their own analysis and take their own action and build their own ownership, then you can really start to think about leaving no one behind. But if you just deliver top-down programs which don't touch those people or engage them, you'll never create that real transformative change. So over to you, Joe. Thanks, Sunny. So I'm going to take you back again to 2015. Um, so we got to 2015 and the participate process had really um, brought some compelling evidence from the margins in the discussion of what should form the SCGs. And we end up with a really exciting new framework, the 17 goals, and the promise of leave no one behind, which was articulated powerfully by the UN, said we will endeavour to reach the furthest behind first. So it's exciting, it's cross-cutting, calls for inclusion, recognition that exclusion requires working in a range of inequalities. And what we've been doing with our work, and also with um, and the World Social Science Report in 2016 really emphasises very strongly 
was to think about um, inequalities across a range of areas, um, economic, spatial, environmental, as well as ident and identity-based. So that's how we've been trying to bring thinking about reaching and working with the, the, the most marginalised into our work. So reaching, finding, reaching, counting the, the most marginalised, what about addressing the barriers to their inclusion, which is also part of the, the biggest part of the challenge. There's been a lot of focus on data, how do we count and find them, who are they, where are they? But the, the barriers are actually then making systemic change and changing institutions so that they, their, their, their efforts to be heard and included are responded to is something I'm going to talk about a bit more. And, so, and then looking forward to now, UNDP is applying the pledge as a principle, this, this is a quote from their uh, 2018 report, as a principle across all of its programming and calling for countries to do three things. Um, this is at national level, asking countries to focus on this. To firstly examine, so disaggregated and people-driven data. So a revolution around what kind of data, so they can reach and understand and really see the intersections. Empowering processes that, that build civic engagement and voice, and enacting from a governmental perspective equity focused SDG policies, interventions, and budgets. And our research in the last, since 2015, which has been contract well, one, has been kind of framed by the implementation phase of the SDGs, is really focusing on that, in, um, on that jump from from processes that build empowerment, reaching the most marginalised, working with them on the process of empowerment to help them to amplify their own voice, the kind of processes that Danny's just been talking about, but then how about getting governments to enact inclusive policies? And uh, we've got a little bit of thinking around that, and unfortunately we don't have all the answers. Um, and there's one more kind of cautionary note around the leave no one behind promise, it's like leave no one behind from what? So whose agenda are we talking about? And this is kind of the, yeah, the country's agenda, the UN's agenda, uh, the donor's agenda. So how can we be thinking from the perspective of those people about what agenda is it they want and how do they want to be included? So working from a starting point the perspective of people in the margins, and um, we've had a couple of projects that have continued our work with the participate network of um, action research organisations. And recognising that accountability in this space is fundamentally important. And so um, working on what that means, what it looks like and how it can, can be constructed through working and uh, through participatory processes working with marginalised groups. And understanding that empowerment, that attempts to empower need to start with them and be rooted in their realities. So hence participation methodologies that work with people in appropriate ways and through careful processes. Um, so the, we've just finished the second phase, building sustainable inclusion, working with partners in Egypt, uh, South Africa, Ghana, India, and Uganda. And I'll talk a little bit, I won't talk about all of them because there's not time, but the report will be launched next month, so please watch this space. Um, so, and I'll highlight three, less, three lessons really. One is about the kind of internal process, internal to the group process lessons, about managing um, how these processes need to be adaptive and how they need to manage the tensions between recognising difference across different forms of exclusion. So when you're bringing them together from different marginalised groups, there are tensions and difficulties there. There's pain, there's uh, stigmatization within those groups, between those groups as well. So how to recognize difference and, and but build collective capacity and collect, for, for collective action at the same time. The second, between claiming rights, amplifying people's voices to claim rights and exposing them to risk. And thirdly, um, what I've alluded to already, is about how opening spaces for accountability within the SDG framework, but building those things that take you from the, from the local level, where a lot of our experience is, and most of our success stories are, up to national level. And just quickly, when we talk about accountability, we're talking about, we take, like we have our, our ideas about what participatory research looks like, 
we also have ideas about what participatory accountability looks like. That it's contextual, it's embedded in context, that it's linked to transparent processes of justice, it's aspirational, and is inclusive. And it cannot rely only on existing formal systems and mechanisms of accountability. It may also, um, it will be, it resonates with um, traditional practice, <coughs> traditional mechanisms, and proactive in seeking out and building new ones through ongoing, ongoing dialogue between the existing and the new. And that marginalised communities must be centrally involved in building this kind of accountability. And it may well, and is likely to, and often does involve confrontation and contestation because the structures of traditional forms of accountability either not, are not functioning or benefit the few and, not, and are designed to exclude um, minorities. So I won't say very much about methods. We have publications, so I've talked a little bit about some of the mes uh, methods that we've used in this process. Um, there's such a range of methods using dance, drama, singing. There's a Pastoki Methods website you might like to, to check. Um, I'll talk a little bit in the, um, uh, the drama, singing, digital stories, and participatory video. A lot of embodied methods, which people are, <coughs> who are non literate can use, but we also enable people to, to communicate things that they could not communicate if they only used text based methods. Okay? So, this is fundamentally important. And also, in terms of the Internal process, the process of working with these groups, and in terms of the message that they can then communicate outwards, and the impact it has, like that video you just saw, <coughs> the digital story, the impact that has on, on people's emotions is, is an important thing. And methods, and because of that, methods are important, important aspect intrinsically of opening up pathways to accountability because they reach people. Um, and I will give you an example shortly. And we're now going to play a collective video. Um, which tells you, uh, just before you start, there are the five partners that we've worked with in the second phase so, um, will each tell you a little bit about their work. So you hear it from them and you'll get some images of the work that they're doing in those five countries. Sokajapi is working with post-conflict communities in the Teso and Karamoya sub-regions in northeastern Uganda. In Uganda, corruption and dysfunctional public structures deprive marginalized people from accessing services. Attitude towards the youth, women, people with disabilities, people living with the HIV and AIDS, and the elderly make them more vulnerable, marginalized, and excluded. The poorest and most marginalized are very difficult to reach. So we ask the communities who is in a worse situation than you, and we involve them in bringing the marginalized people together. But the intrinsic tension was the differences between people makes it difficult to build collective action. So we focused on common concerns to build shared identities and good purpose. The lesson is that it is important to have enough time to reach the most marginalized and help the groups to develop capacities to demand what they need. We at Praxis work with a group of denotified tribes who comprise of over 150 million people living in India. In the late 1800s, the British labeled tribal communities as criminal because of the activities and livelihoods that they pursued. Even though in the 50s, the Indian government denotified this group, there is a stigma and discrimination of being born into the criminalized identity. The denotified community face two key challenges. The criminal label is actually a socially reinforced label rather than a legal one. And the data generation model has created multiple sets of categories. But because there isn't one for denotified tribes, they're just excluded and not counted. We felt for denotified tribes, absence of data is the real problem. And therefore, we facilitated communities to co-create narratives, generate data in various forms. But we realized these narratives were not accepted 
in mainstream spaces because of the deep rooted prejudices against these communities. In Ghana, the Adana women salt winners are deprived access to the Sunga Lagoon, which is the main source of their livelihood. This is the failure of the traditional duty bearers, that is the chiefs, to protect this resource for the whole community. Radio Adan, a community radio stations, have collaborated with Yika Chairman women to build their capacities to express their concerns, to champion their cause, to challenge the social norms, to take their place in decision making. The problem is, this has set up tensions between the women and some of the chiefs and some of the men who are involved in the private mining. So the group has responded by using songs and dance to lessen social tensions and the radio has helped to legitimize their concerns. We have learned how to navigate those local tensions and we need now to use this approach to build a dialogue with other duty bearers. People living with HIV, AIDS, and Egypt are a hidden minority group that faces extreme stigma and discrimination, which hinders their active participation in establishing and maintaining accountable relationships with duty bearers, for example, healthcare service providers and policy and decision makers. Most of participants come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, increasing the vulnerability to discrimination, telling the unheard lived experiences people living with HIV would allow becoming recognized. Therefore, we engage supportive, trustworthy community members to record their stories. Elder townships are home to 50% of our South Africans. But 84% from doubt is unemployed. We found in doubt that residents are ignorant to the rights to access government services. There's a lack of safe spaces to meet, and government doesn't want to come to our ground level to discuss anything with us. In our work, we experience an unexpected tension between building accountable relationships and strongly challenging duty bearers. We released our film, Cancers in Uniform, which is about police corruption and brutality in doubt, without sensitizing the police about the purpose of film. <coughs> a key step to building accountability in doubt was a link with the police, but we lost that opportunity because the police took offense to the work. We learned that it was important to think critically, not only about the plan steps that are needed to build accountability, but also to reflect and respond throughout the process to navigate what happens. So thanks to our partners for their efforts and creativity. Um, both in these processes and, and working with us to create our video, um, which is the kind of output that then enables them to speak in international spaces when we come back to thinking about how you lo link local, national, and global. Um, so there, we were seeing or hearing, hearing and seeing the kind of um, different elements of the participatory processes that. Uh, our partners have been working with marginalised groups to support them to um, engage with duty bearers. But that the first phase has been about reaching them and not using maybe, maybe traditional participatory methods where you hold a community a village meeting because they found in Uganda that the people who are most marginalised aren't in that meeting. So when they came to the village and said to the leader, please, can you tell us who are the the people living with HIV, AIDS, the, the elderly, and so on. Not the most, not everybody came, and so they then had to ask. And um, Ben said in the video, we asked who is in a worse situation than you, and then reached out through those constituencies that had come to the village meeting to reach the furthest, um, the, the more marginalised. 
And also that particular example, when they were working with five different um, uh, officially vulnerable groups, according to the Ugandan government, but working with them together. So the group process involved helping them to find ways of being together and overcoming the stigma that they each experience and that they see when they relate to each other. They weren't immediately comfortable with being in a room and talking together. So there was a group process there in, in building trust and overcoming those differences. Um, and what they found was once they had began to build that trust and recognize that they shared uh, they had a shared experience of exclusion from public services. They had shared experience of, of stigma and mistreatment from people. And then they also found, once they were, once they found out that they had rights, they didn't know about this. And they, it, he says, but as you explained, there is national provision for your groups. You have rights in the constitution. He says, once they understood this, they understood they have powers. It was like a sudden revel revelation. And they all took together this kind of slogan of. Um, Kojen uh, Apelo, which is about um, uh, power and accountability, and in fact, one participant made a song about accountability. So it was very, it was a very powerful idea for them to, to bring them together to work together. Um, so building that sense of uh, of group and trust and cohesion, number three. Um, also, back to number two, expressive confidence, building the confidence to be able to speak about your situation in the public arena. So the, the beginning of that video, you saw a community baraza, and where, so what our partner did was support these people to um, identify issues that they and other marginalized people were experiencing in the communities, and then prepare to talk about those issues in the public forum of the baraza, which is like in the village public forum and share these issues with these areas and convert those messages also into community theatre. So the messages about exclusion and mistreatment were spoken and but were also um, uh, dramatised to really um, have a powerful effect both on the community that came together to watch this, this is a great community drama going on, a bit of entertainment, but also the duty bearers. And the else, those who know, system there, LC ones, LC twos, LC threes, who came um, and, and witnessed and were, were present at the Baraza and were very impressed by the, the dramatisation. <coughs> so converting stories from people's lived realities into a communication tool, um, as well as a, a way of um, analysing uh, the issues themselves. <coughs> um, and building shared purpose while maintaining awareness of the differences. This is what we've, we're emphasising. It's difficult and needs to be managed carefully. Um, so, <coughs> the, other, the other dimension is about from the internal group work, which has taken a lot of energy and effort, and, um, and needs a company organisation who has the, facility, uh, the facilitating skills to really invest in those processes. And that's the bit in Danny's, going back to Danny, the diagram that Danny showed earlier, but the kind of circle going on at the bottom. That, I feel, we feel was pretty good in a lot of places. And a lot of experience, a lot of experience as well that the plan supported this. And iterative processes of building capacity of, of, of um, creating spaces for the groups to analyze issues together, but then take them to, and from there deciding on appropriate actions. So that's, that's the second uh, tension, really, is about appropriate action, and that involves risk. So at each step in this process, when you're in supporting, working with marginalized groups to put their heads, to, to, to stand up and be counted, or to, to challenge duty bearers, it involves risk. As um, in the last story in that video, um, in, in Cape Town, they were talking about how there was a backlash on this and they spoke out about police corruption in their township. And also how you build ownership, not only of, of the community, um, recognising that um, the community working together or the group working together, but ownership where duty bearers themselves feel that they are part of, responsible for, or can work together in collaboration with the community to achieve greater accountability and hopefully in the end achieve the SDGs. That is, uh, so what we are saying that participatory methods and processes can contribute to building that ownership 
but it's, it, is, uh, it is very challenging. But the most challenging of all is building up the scale and sustainability of these processes. Um, one way is to, one way that the groups are working is to build counter narratives, and so through the, especially through the song and dance, they're promoting uh, uh, a narrative about themselves and about development that is different, that doesn't stigmatize. Um, and so community theatre and dance and song are really important for getting the messages up and to be accessible at scale. But even so, there are challenges. Um, and the ownership may be taken by some duty bearers, but it also requires identifying champions and building alliances. So some duty bearers are actually the blockage themselves, and alternative routes have to be found. What we talked about in, we talked about in our work, and Hamaran as well talks about, is the accountability ecosystem. And one of our partners was the Egyptian partner, and he was up there looking at health and access to and improving health services. And they said that if there's a missing duty bearer in this, if, if there's somebody that you can't reach and, and won't cooperate, then, then it's very difficult to, to achieve um, accountability in that, around that particular issue or, or across the system because there's an element in it that's blocking it. So missing actors, are, um, and then there's alternative allies. In some places, social movements, networks, the church in, in um, Uganda has been uh, is, is a big ally in some contexts. Um, so just to end on the persistent challenge of scaling up, um, we've been we've we've tried different ways of getting messages upwards, um, finding ways of maybe holding a national event in each country, engaging with the media. In Ghana, they've worked very because they use community radio and they have. Um, and they have networks into national media and um, community radio networks across the country. That's, that's an effective way of scaling up at least the message. But there's still the, the barrier of trying to actually get in and change um, people, to, uh, change the minds, mindsets, and uh, have an effect or, or shift things in the policy-making process. And as um, our great radio radar partner in Ghana says, the women, the, so the women of the song board who were working with soldiers on the video. They, at the beginning of the process, they had no voice. It's a very patriarchal system. They weren't, um, they weren't invited into decision-making spaces, uh, traditional or any other, and didn't, and didn't have the confidence to do that. But now, through the process, they can, so they can now talk to the chiefs, which seemed impossible at the start. But is it enough? We're certain that these processes have tremendous trans transformative power in supporting the empowerment of those who are the most disadvantaged. But it has not done so well in facilitating the transformation of those in power, those with vested interests. So one, one thing that we also tried and what the practice has been trying is, okay, we'll jump the national level and we'll go to global level. And so um, we, um, they made a, a participatory, participatory video, they held a ground level panel, which Dan was talking about earlier, where Members of the Denotified Tribes came together to discuss, share their stories, discuss issues, uh, analyze stories from across the communities, and identify how they related to the SDGs, and then produce a small, a short film, which we then showed at a side event at the High Level Political Forum at the UN, when the countries come together to um, to uh, give uh, to uh, deliver their reports to the United Nations, and India was reporting that year. But that's great, and they had a voice in that global space, and the UN is really interested in what they're doing, and UNDP and the USF were very supportive. But what about national government, and how can, then, how can they open that space to really bring about change at that level? So highlighted their national being uh, a problematic point and that we need to pay more attention to. I think, Danny, you wanted to add a word on that? Yeah, just a final uh, couple of reflections, which is about these levels, really. I think what our experience actually from both of these processes has been, the pre-SDG phase when it was being created and afterwards, is that actually it's, we have the tools, we have the mechanisms, we understand the processes, I mean us and our partners on the ground, to do really good participatory work on the ground. And actually, we were really effective in our global work 
The problem is, is that the SDG uh, uh, directives into these uh, uh, different domains is held by country governments. And actually the country governments aren't very receptive. And that's the space in the middle where we're finding it hardest to, to interact. Um, I think the other thing that's probably worth saying is that, you know, often the problem isn't with policies. You go back to the example that I was talking about. I mean, a lot of the countries we're working with have good policies on things like bonded labour. But actually, the issue at a national level is to ensure that, you know, incompetence and lack of capacity at a local level is dealt with, or corruption, or non-enforcement, or simply, <coughs> frankly and directly, active suppression of local people. The national government has a responsibility to deal with that, and they don't. Um, and I, th I just want to sort of leave you with one last thought, which is this. And it reflects a critical point that um, Joe's work has been focusing on, which is power. There is a reason why people are poor and marginalized. They don't just happen to be there, that they just like were scattered randomly across the universe. They're there because other people have vested interests in keeping them marginalized and keeping them poor. So the only way to challenge that when we're thinking about the SDGs is to make sure that our programs deal with power. If you just channeling resources and giving people information and putting stuff in places, it will not change the power relationships. And that's what our task is. So that's why we have to focus on empowerment and participatory processes. Otherwise we're tinkering around the edges and leave no, no one behind becomes something in, in, entirely meaningless. So I think just Remember that whatever we do, if it doesn't deal with the power issues, it's meaningless. Fantastic. Thank you, both of you, and some incredibly powerful examples. Um, and great to have them presented through videos and in people's own, own voices. Um, and having been at some of the fora, not all of them at all, where, where Joe's work particularly has been presented, including a big conference in the Caribbean, as well as a kind of more academic fora in London, I can testify to the kind of impact this work is beginning to have. Although, as Danny points out, there are some really big challenges and they are to do with, with power at all sorts of levels. So let's now open it up to questions and to comments. Um, and we also might have some coming through from our online audience, so if the comms team can wave at me if there are some to take. Let's take a group and then we'll come back to you, Danny and Joe, and then take some others. So there's somebody at the back there. I wasn't prepared to shout, <laughs> but this was great. Thank you, Joe and, um, and Dan, for this um, comprehensive glimpse of what I know is a very um, complex initiative. And the question that I have has to do with the notion of participatory accountability from your perspective as partners for trying to facilitate these processes in contexts where, as you said, you are dealing with often multidimensional structural sources of oppression. And when you are assembling these processes, that you are perhaps putting people at risk of being exposed to the very groups that are oppressing them. So I'm, I'm interested how you talked a little bit about managing risk, for instance. So I would like some, to hear a bit more about examples of what you would do, and also where your responsibility lies as an institutional partner in protecting some of the groups that you help uh, bring together. Great question. Right. Who else? I'd like to chip in on this point. Come on, people. I'm sure you can't all agree on some silence. Here is one in front of me. Yeah. Uh, in regards to like, uh, as you have like rightly mentioned, that the main protein locus is the national setup. So in that regard, uh, one of the crucial arguments of SDG is that uh, the fund or the financing need to be like inclusive, and one of the major component needs to come from the national government or national setup. So, in your research or like in your focus, 
have you addressed that part that how all the programs, all the initiatives under the like SDGs and particularly with this like marginalized group, uh, how the financing option has been working so far, the countries you are working on or what are the challenges that probably you are facing? Thank you for the presentation. So, uh, my question is related to our own supply by like, uh, the international organization and the NGO. So, I think, uh, in my opinion, our own is kind of uh, have a kind of uh, the relation between the uh, corruption or the some like the government power because it usually goes to the uh, high or middle income. The people. So, uh, this is covered like the ones supplied by NGOs or international organizations. Okay. And let's maybe take one more over here. <coughs> Hi, um, it was a very interesting lecture, thank you. And, um, I'm from Nigeria, and what you just the video you just showed about, especially in Uganda, is very emotional to me because corruption and um, I'm not to explain it. But let me start this way. I have an NGO in Nigeria, and there's intersectional social support, and the the main issue that we have is because of that collection. We have tried everything to make people to come up, to open up, to say something. Especially especially because we're trying to go through the psychological aspect. So especially about okay, two two weeks ago, there was um some people were protesting about an activist that that spoke out about um, the the massive killing in the North, Nigerian North, Kadina Spain and the leader was arrested and he has not gone down taking to court or anything no judgment people are speaking out taking to court and do something about it nothing so somebody was like maybe a little bit aggressive and the military were they're just passing by and this is what they call them the shot and the military were just passing by and because they saw the military they got like more aggressive took some stones and started throwing in the kingdom and shot them up and now the press not saying anything about it and nothing is being seen about it. And even if you want to try and talk to people, they're scared because if they can just shoot people anyhow, how do you expect them to come up and say something about it? So you said also, I don't know how they actually brought the indigenous people to speak out, but I would really need you to like give solutions towards um, research convention. Thank you. Okay. Some more really powerful stories emerging here. Um, over to you two to respond to some of those. <laughs> Well, I suppose there's, there's certainly the, the first and the last contributions are connected in some ways around risk um, and around speaking out and around power and what happens when you speak to power. Um, and actually, I would say this is one of the biggest things that we're confronting as a team right now, thinking about how do we handle that um, as as participatory researchers, as you as you ask the question, what's our responsibility? Um, and I guess just as a starting point, a few reflections. I think one of the problems, and it's partly highlighted by what you're saying, is that the experience of marginalisation and poverty is one in which people face risk every day. So to act is to um, open up risk, and to not act is to open up risk. Um, I think the critical issue is how people engage with that risk collectively themselves and um, supporting people with the tools to assess the risks um, and to make sure that they know what they are and to make sure that they know collectively what they're going to do and how they're going to support each other. And I think the collective bit is really, really important. I and mean, I can give you one simple example, which isn't in this quite as extreme a realm, but could be. Um, back to the example of South India, where some of the liquor stores were closed. A number of people, a number of the women closed the liquor stores. 
Some of them were arrested. The whole village then came together to support them. The whole village is supporting their legal costs. Um, and they're, they're, they're acting as a collective. I'm not saying that's the answer to the problem. I'm faced with the sort of things that you're talking about. It's not always easy to do that. But the reality is, is that oppression has only ever been dealt with by collective action. I mean, anywhere, ever. Um, and we have a part in that, but the real, the real part to play is the local people who live, who live in those situations. I think our role in this, ultimately, is about supporting people to generate the evidence they need to think about exactly what their situation is, to think about what they need to do, and to think about what action they can take. And then to, to help them, insofar as help is quite the right word, support, and to think about the risks in relationship to the action that they're going to take. But it's very much about building an evidence base. Um, and the other thing is that when you're in an action research group, and this is really important to what we've been talking about here, um, you can't separate out like the action and the implications of the action from the research itself. Yeah. You can't separate out the advocacy and the communication from the research itself. In traditional research, here's the data, and there's what you do with it. In our research, they're all connected. So the action researchers, not only will they be saying, what's the best solution, but they'll also be saying, what are we facing in order to get there? What are the power relationships? What's going to happen if we do this? And that's just as much part of the research as you know, how many people are in the situation and what causes what. So, just to add a little bit more on that, in fact, both those questions, the first and the last, um, that there are very concrete ways, in fact, that our partners have addressed this. And uh, through the analysis that we did at the end, we've highlighted managing risk as absolutely fundamental, both within the group work process and once the group is at a stage where they want to start engaging externally, so that there are risks within the group as well. Um, some might run, for example, working in India with the denotified and nomadic tribes, they, again, with across, the, the, there's a huge range of groups that, that um, were trying to come together around to kind of, with under a national kind of um, label, if you like, so that they could mobilize around that, take collective action around that, but they weren't, they didn't, they didn't collectively identify with each other, so there were huge risks for them in, in working together. And in Egypt, the risk for children living with HIV AIDS to be, to become, to be exposed, so we started off and started off talking about doing digital storytelling, and well, we can't, we can't use their images, and we can't even use their voices, so how are we going to use their, what, and then, even more complicated, not all of the children knew what they what, what was wrong with them because their carers wanted to protect them. So then like, well, how on earth do we do participatory work with, when we can't even talk about what's wrong with them? And so in the end there was a process with the caring parents and carers and another process with the children and the collected evidence and then um, uh, the parents and carers worked with a, a storyteller, narrator, a, a graphic a graphic narrator, if you like, who then designed a story which, which communicated those experiences but kept everybody safe because they were not identified. No one, you couldn't even use a, a, a voice because that might be identified. I'll, I'll give you another example from a completely different context. Um, we've been doing some participatory research on conflict and peace building in northern Myanmar in Kachin. And we're working with multiple groups and we've been supporting local activists to collect narratives. Um, and then go through some of the processes you've seen about building narratives, building system apps and so on. And there was a particular moment where two different groups came together. So the people that came down from Liza, who if you like are behind the, the lines of the Kitchen Independence Army, and they met in last year in Northern Shan State with a whole of other groups. And because it's participatory, we said, you bring the people you want to bring in, you bring the people you want to bring in, they all came together. And we sat everybody in a circle, um, and at the first meeting, um, it became clear that the Liza people had brought mostly community members. The last year people had brought community members, but they also included some ex-policemen and some ex-military people, and the Liza people were not comfortable with that. <coughs> 
and they saw that as high risk. So we went away and we had some conversations with them and said, well, how are we going to handle this? Um, because they're in that live moment, they're assessing the risk within a, within a participatory process. And what they said was, look, um, what we can do is we can build our maps separately. Right, so they take their stories and build their maps. We'll take our stories and we'll build our maps. And that's what they did. And then we brought them together and they shared the maps. So the narratives were protected, the individual stories were protected, but their collective depictions of the system dynamics which drove the conflict from their perspective was shared. And so the actual the, the mechanisms of doing participatory research in this way can provide a way of mitigating conflict or mitigating risk. But it has to be explicit and thought about. And my experience of doing this work is that there are risks around every corner. And so we have to be deeply reflective and have to constantly be reassessing our process with the participants at every step of the way. And can I add something that maybe ties into this question of financing and PSCGs? Um, I think for the groups that we're working with, um, this is entirely unknown, invisible, and <laughs> incomprehensible. The, the <laughs> and to give you an example so, uh, of both, navigating the risk and also the, the setting for so the women in the, the salt lagoon of the song law. The government's idea of what to do with the salt lagoon is to privatise it, which means that the women who have traditionally earned their living from winning salt from the lagoon using artisan processes will no longer, longer have a livelihood. So if it's that, that's the model of development, then they, are, but they will have no livelihood. And their, their identities, their, their uh, tribal identity, if you like, is also rooted in that place. They came there and they have they have very important stories and that's why song and dance was so important for communicating their history, the why they were there, why it's traditional for them to win the salt and how they really needed to claim this lagoon back and challenge their traditional leaders who should be protecting that resource for them. But um, in that process they had to assess at every point that creating a space in which to assess risk was really important and that at times they stopped. And I think not taking action is equally important as taking action and knowing when to stop, when they had to reassess and rebuild their cohesion as a group, because there were points where some women were actually doing some private, uh, um, had some private salt pans, which is what they were, they, as a group, they were supposed to be mobilizing against. And so then they had to resolve this and, and do some soul searching and work together as a group before they could then, yeah, so. So having that space, facilitating space where they could manage these things. Excellent. So let's take a few more. You missed the question on corruption, but I wasn't in time. Didn't fully understand it. Yeah. I'm actually going to throw one in to this slight gap um, because you've given us obviously a very very compelling picture of what it begins to mean to be there on behind. And also, I think a compelling analysis of the problem being with power relations and, in a sense, the vested interests of national elites in not marginalising people. But to what extent is the very structure of the SDGs, their measurement, their, their national level, their reporting structures, also part of the problem? I'm just wondering, certainly at the beginning of the implementation process, there's been a lot of emphasis in national governments on reporting, on having quantitative indicators, on being able to measure progress against the various targets, not just the 17, but the individual targets. And, um, that's often being sent off to national statistical services. There are problems with getting hold of that data, it's often quite siloed. Um, and in a way, one could see, even leaving the vested interests aside, the very structure of reporting and data working straight against um, being able to take seriously the kind of intersecting stories of marginalisation and what to do about them that you're sharing. So I'd just be interested in your comments on that disconnect and also perhaps in any ways that you've seen over since 2015 the reporting processes themselves move at all. To what extent are they shifting to be able to take seriously some of these stories? But that's my question. Let's have some more from the floor. Yeah, one at the back here. Um, 
thank you. Um, I'm interested, I think Danny, you mentioned that it's really hard in actual research, or we can't separate action from the research. And so I was interested to hear some reflections from you as researchers who work <coughs> with an institution like this one that has, you know, often has quite a few boundaries around what researchers can and can't do. Um, yeah, just how you've met sort of some of those challenges. Um, and, you know, particularly when I think about the research I have done uh, with Indigenous communities in Australia, I think about sort of the importance of solidarity in that, and sometimes, yeah, it can be challenging as if it's with your own ethical standpoint to come as the outsider and meet some of those um, power dynamics at, as being an outside, inside of kind of researcher. So, yeah, it's interesting your reflections on that through this process. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. I, I really enjoy learning about the methods and the approaches, which I think are really encouraging and um, fantastic. But I, I, I think the most powerful statement, and it was yours at the end, when you said poverty and uh, oppression are not just random, they're not like the colour of your hair, they're not like the colour of your eyes, it, it is something which is called. And um, so I think. We also have to understand that what we're trying to do is in a world in which we have 43 people who own half the world's wealth. And they how, how do we actually push back against that? Um, the, the money lenders who are pushed, just like in Britain, the money lenders who are pushed out, like Wonga was last year, the money lenders in Tamil Nadu will have to go somewhere else to get their money. They're not going to they're not going to die or go away or, or you know, start up a, a charity. They, they are going to recreate what they do with, with other people. Um, bonded labor was a huge issue when I first started my work 40 years ago in India. That hasn't gone away. So these, these systems of power are, are very sustainable. <laughs> and, 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 they, and those systems of power are capable of reforming themselves into new ways when they do get challenged. You know, you have the Zuckerbergs who reinvent something to make money out of um, uh, uh, Uber and so on. So what, what, I, what I'm basically saying is that actually the SDGs reflect that system of power. They are not contrary to it. But what we're allowed to have is the SDGs in a world in which that structure of power channels money to the ultra wealthy and wealthy. And, and so how do we work with that? And I think these are questions not, not for you. Do comment if you want, Joan. I mean, these are questions that we have to discuss at IDS more generally. That this is where do our little bits of work to try and fix the problem, how do they exist in a world where far more resources are making the problem worse? Absolutely. Good point. Okay, so we come down to the front Thank you. Um, it was very interesting, thank you very much. I want to highlight what you said about the narratives and how people frame their, their objectives and the questions themselves and analyze their own narratives. I think that's very valuable because development doesn't mean the same for, for this, all the people. But in the, in the framework of the SDGs, when we have, where we have a very specific narrative with certain specific targets and objectives, how do we reconcile the meaning of the SDGs with the meaning of the people, because sometimes it can be even contradictory. And also, how, how can we, what you say about uh, challenging the power structures, national level have, have a very important role in this, as you said, as well. So maybe they're not on board on giving up on the power that they have, so can we have that and use this framing that they're in charge of to make it more democratic as well. I don't know if you, you feel as clear. So that's actually a set question really about the structural power that is embodied in the SDGs themselves. Yeah. And, and it would be great to hear your comments yeah. on those. Well, I'll start. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, and we are very aware that the SDGs have a mixed uh, audience or um, mixed views, and that for some they are perpetuating the system of, um, of inequality. The way that we've engaged with them, with our partners, and with um, groups um, 
living in my circumstances, is to see them as potentially an opportunity. But separate from whether or not the SDGs do anything useful, these processes are, are fundamentally important for them and start with them. If there is an opportunity through the, uh, if the, the SDGs are like a window of opportunity, where there, there is a discourse there which, which offers some uh, alternative ways of working. And I don't know if time is running out. If from 2015, to, no, I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like 2013. Yeah. Yeah. So we're now, we're now into the third year of the SDGs. Um, and has, is that window actually closed? And they've now, it's now become, you know, really rigid. And now we're all getting on with our voluntary national reports, and we'll just all go through this charade every year in New York, where everyone goes, "Oh look, we've done all these great things for the marginalised, and no one's left behind." And it'll be well done, and you know, is that what we're buying into, or is that little window still open? And are people paying attention to these serious issues? And I think people still are paying attention. And there's a huge amount of energy, a huge amount of energy went into the process of of from civil society organisations trying to shift the way that they were established, these, these goals. And that hasn't gone away. There's still, and so Together 2030 is a, 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 the global network of civil society organisations trying to get other versions of reality to be of other forms of evidence into these uh, global forums. So I think, and then the, the UN is, is trying to do things at national level, so they can be other. In some countries, they can be an ally, and they're interested in this agenda, and they're interested in seeing how, how you can work in a, work in joined up ways, and how there is potential to listen to perception data, perception data, they call it, as well as uh, the, the traditional forms of data. So I think there are opportunities, but whether or not I wouldn't want to overhype them. So just just on that one, um, just a few reflections. Uh, one is quite positive, and the rest are a bit more critical. Um, I think the positive side for me is that there's, uh, there's actually 17 goals. I actually think that's good. But that it's not all sort of like, here's eight, eight things that you're going to do, and then you've got this completely linear focus on a certain set of indicators. The fact that they're multiple and varied actually potentially speaks to the complexity of people's lives. So I think that's good. Um, but I think there are some, I mean, there's probably millions of difficulties, but I'll just highlight a few. One is that there are still some things missing. I mean, there are things like, for example, mental health is not really there. And it speaks to, um, you know, the speaker earlier, and the situation that she was highlighting around psychosocial issues and so on. So there's some things are missing. Second thing is that, um, actually, of course, the SDGs are one massive great compromise. And you've got, you know, a whole bunch of stuff around business and markets and you know all of that stuff combined with climate change and environmental protection and you look at this and you think really <laughs> and that's your systemic problem because it's just now you can't unlock that intellectually they're actually contradictory <laughs> right um, I think the third thing is that you know is the point that really that Terry was making that. Um, these, these things are actually about national government programs and funding from major agencies to deliver programs in a classic aid <coughs> mode. Um, and actually, if we're going to challenge power structures, we need to think much more about movement-based change rather than program-based change. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about how people start to mobilize against foreign labor. Yeah, there's some stuff which is programmatic, which is important about people's rights, about the information they get, they, about access to services, enforcement against traffickers and so on. That's important. But actually what's going to shift the system is when people build a collective consciousness, they build solidarity, they organize together. So interventions which support collective action are absolutely critical to changing these power relationships. Structurally, the SDGs is not about that at all. Um, so maybe there are opportunities within the SDG system to build that, but I think you're right, there is a, there is a deep problem with the, the thinking behind the SDGs. Um, and we've just got to take the opportunities, but actually build alongside and in parallel and contrary where we need to. Right, so we've probably got time for one more round, so Richard, and then I'll continue.
First, I want to say I'm really, really very pleased that we've got an SDG meeting now. I think there's another one coming up uh, later. Uh, and I think it's absolutely important. I agree with most things that Danny said, but not all. I want to say, secondly, uh, I took part last week in two sets of meetings about the SDGs. One was in Geneva by UNRIS, and it was concerned with elites and inequality, both issues very much brought up, sorry, inequality, brought up in the SDGs, and it was almost totally about power. But don't imagine that the only power that matters is this grassroots. It's absolutely essential to have the grassroots, but you do need to have tackling power of the whole economic system. And that's the reason why I like many of the 17 goals, because they do deal with the economic and social. So the other meeting I took part in last week was in Lewis. What do the SDGs meet in Lewis, mean for Lewis? And we had presentations from New Haven, presentations from Kent, presentations from Bristol, very exciting, and presentations from uh, Brighton Hove. So, I, I'm not going to try and attempt to summarize that, but the, the SDGs are universal. Mm. And for the first time, the MDGs were not, and none of the other UN goals were yet. So it's very important that those of us who live in the developed country say, okay, what are the SDGs meaning for us? And, um, and so forth. My question to you is actually, as you, you said, Danny, there are 17 SDGs. I took most of your experiences, of both of you, Joe and yourself, as being implicitly or even explicitly about the most marginalized people, therefore in poverty. But did the broader issues of other SDGs, broader issues of other actions to get out of poverty come up? Um, yes, there was somebody over here. Yeah. Hello, thank you for the interesting session. Uh, my question is more related to the practicality of such uh, action-based programs in the field. So, like, you have been working across different countries, and so my question is like, how do you face the problem of like, I think, language barrier and cultural differences? For example, when I was like working within my own country, but I had I felt that language barrier was <coughs> one of the like one was the problem I was facing because most of these marginalized groups don't even speak the language of majority. Right? And once you're trying to talk to them, you usually uh, rely on people like a little educated segment of those marginalized groups to understand both languages. But I think that once they are <coughs> to the group. The, the biases that they have are still pretty much there, how they're communicating. Like right? the idea of learning that right? they are telling the other people, is, is still the biases are still there. So it's very difficult to change. So do we have to like train those people in the middle first and then they go in you know, society or work? And how do you face this? Another thing that how <coughs> it becomes the clash between the cultural beliefs and SDGs, for example. Gender equality itself sounds very, very nice, like you all need it. But it's also about how you put it into action and, and that sometimes it clashes with the you know, social norms or like cultural conflicts. So if you and you were working across countries, so probably you will have like more challenges to face. So my question is how do you sort of deal with such issues? Thank you. I'm going to answer the first question. Yes, yeah, Joe has to slip away, so don't Joe. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for raising that. And, and I meant to mention, Richard, thank you for raising about the universal, and I don't know why I forgot to mention it, but I think that's, it, that is a, tr a tremendously important <laughs> aspect that suddenly development <coughs> is about all of us and sees it as in connect, interconnected. I think we're all, well, not we're all, I think the UK government is still really struggling to see that it's part of the story rather than being about them over there. Yeah, but there are local 
lo local experiences within the UK where local governments and local activists are coming together and saying, actually, we want to see, and this will include something that we know needs to happen, is changing the behaviour of the people who have more resources and power than the people that don't. And um, I think that's exciting, and I think we really need to do more. And as a, an institute, I'd be really yeah, excited for us to do more. And I'm going to start. Well, Jo, we'll let Jo go because she's actually going back to the heartland of UK action on the SDGs uh -huh. in Bristol. But um, just to say, I think that's a really, really critical point. I mean, what would be fantastic is to see the kind of work we've done with the participate network happening in, in communities in this country. Yes. And also to know that the UK has to report next year or has offered to report next year on, on UK achievements of the SDGs, and which will be a very interesting event. Thank you very much. Jo, thank you very much thank you. indeed. So I will leave Danny to finish off, but it's the one more burning question before I ask, I ask, turn to Danny for any final remarks. <laughs> Robert, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I thought we would keep a rather quiet over there. <laughs> so, I mean, I found this very moving and very inspiring. And it made me think about the scale and whether a priority actually for us now should be thinking about enabling other people to do likewise the sorts of things that you've been, been doing. I mean, we've had the 18 partners, there are these other partners now, but do we need to reflect and to see how this sort of approach, the attitudes, the commitment, the sensitivity, the reflexivity, how, how all of these might, might Go to say, well, and it makes me wonder whether we do enough here um, in IDS, whether there are people here who would really like more of this than we um, share in the present moment. It just, it's just a, a thought that I mean, it would be so wonderful if this sort of thing could really go to scale. And partly through movements, yes, but it's, it's more than that. Okay, fantastic. Well, so Danny, a few questions yeah. there and any final remarks? Okay, a few last thoughts. Um, so on the language question, I think this is really important. I mean, basically, we will always do this work and we will always support the facilitation of this work in the languages of the people who are living in the communities. There's no point in working um, in Mali in, in French or in um, Kenya in English or whatever it is. Um, or in Nepal, in Nepal, we're working with the Bondi laborers in Eastern Terrain and Natili. And that means that we're not doing the work, the local people are doing the work. So we're supporting the local people, we're supporting the most marginalised. It always has to be that way. Um, but there are other issues. For example, when we're working with disabled people, we have to make sure that there is proper sign language. And when we're thinking about participatory methods, we have to make sure that while the visual methods can be engaged with by people who can't see. Um, so one of the implications of leave no one behind is that we actually have to put the resources into doing that. And then Joe talked about many of the people that we're talking about don't just turn up to meetings, we have to find them, that's a resource. Right? Or to engage and communicate, we have to invest more than we would otherwise. But that's really, really important to recognize. Um, the second thing I think is about culture, and it came up in the other batch of questions, and so we get the opportunity to answer it here is about the clash between local cultural beliefs and the SDGs. I think that's always going to be tricky. I think sometimes the clash is just simply because there is a political difference and the SDGs maybe in some cases supporting certain types of vested interests which communities want to challenge. Sometimes it can be the other way around. What people perceive as progressive politics in terms of things like women's empowerment aren't necessarily seen the same way at a local level. But I think one message is clear, that if you're going to, for example, change social norms, you're never ever going to change them unless you get a local level. <coughs> you cannot impose a change of social norms. And that's another reason why a participatory process has become so critical. Because people are in dialogue with each other, they're gathering evidence together, they're taking action together, they're contesting each other, and they're changing their minds. And that's the only way you can change social norms. And that's the only way uh, these cultural differences get shifted. Um, so that was uh, that one. And then the last one was...
one's sort of a value to scale. Well, I think I would say that much of my practice in the last 15 years has been dealing with this question. Because on the one hand, we have the classic top-down international development programs which reach large numbers of people but often do completely the wrong things. Um, often are catastrophic failures on a large scale and so on. On the other hand, you have these small participatory processes which are wonderful that only reach you know, a village. So actually our challenge over the last 10 to 15 years is, has been how can we build participatory processes which can scale? How can we catalyze processes which move from village to village to village to village? Um, and you know, I, I think we're beginning to have the methodologies to do that. The challenge now is to bring them into the mainstream. And we are starting to see that. For example, we've just um, begun, or started on the road, a major multi-million pound child labor program, which is funded by DFID, so it's a mainstream donor, which is entirely rooted in an action research process. Now that's a shift from traditional uh, programmatic ways of doing things. So if we can start to move the thinking into that sort of modality, then maybe we've got some possibilities of, of creating the sort of shift that we're always talking about. Okay, well, Danny, thank you so much. I mean, I too found this hugely inspiring, and I think at the sort of beginning of this set of lectures, this was a very important salutary kind of starting point for us to begin to think about the SDGs in the terms that matter to the people who are living them, and are often at the bottom of the global structural and national inequalities that are actually at the heart of why we have unsustainable problematic development. So I think this has been a really fantastic lecture. Thank you so much to Danny and also to, to Joe. And please join me in a final round of applause. <laughs>